We've talked about what happens to the electric field of a plane wave when it goes into a dielectric, but you don't see the electric field. The electric field oscillates too fast. You see the irradiance. You see how much energy per unit area per unit time that oscillating electric field is dumping into your eye if you're talking about what you see. So we derived an expression for the irradiance. Remember, it was the uh, time average of the pointing vector. And it was EE equals 1 half epsilon naught c squared E naught B naught. Because remember, the pointing vector uh, was E cross B, or some constants in E cross B. Well, usually in optics, we just think about the electric field, because the electric field interacts more strongly with, with light, or more strongly with, with matter. So we usually like to do everything in terms of the electric field and not have to keep up with the magnetic field. So we can make that 1 half epsilon naught and just convert that B naught into an E naught over C if we're just talking about amplitudes. And it becomes C naught squared, one of them canceled, E naught squared. Okay. So remember, E little e is irradiance. E, anything else, is usually electric field. So this is the irradiance in terms of the electric field. You pretty much square the electric field and include constants. So we know this is the amplitude of the plane wave. But now we have the amplitude of a plane wave in a dielectric medium. So that's 1 half epsilon naught c. And in the medium, we have the e naught. And that was the original amplitude. But then it decays at minus, two, at minus um, uh, n i, the imaginary part, times the vacuum wave length times z. Right? We talked about how the electric field decays. And that has to be squared. So EE then, the irradiance for the plane wave, <coughs> is 1 half epsilon naught c e naught squared, the amplitude of the electric field when we started, squared, times e to the minus 2 in i, imaginary part of the refractive index, and the vacuum wavelength, k naught. And now, you, if you recognize this as sort of the incident irradiance, then you can say, the EE, the irradiance as a function of position, is E, E naught, how much irradiance enters the dielectric medium, and then usually E to the minus alpha Z, where alpha is the absorption coefficient. And you can see it's equal to minus 2 Ni K naught. So if you have a, a dielectric medium and you know the imaginary part of its refractive index at some wavelength, then you can calculate its exact absorption coefficient, which will tell you how quickly the amplitude or the irradiance will go down as you go through the material. And there's really just a factor of two difference between how the power goes down and how the field goes down. And the factor of two is just because the power, the irradiance, is the field squared. Okay. But there's always a factor of two between those two. So now, we've been talking about dielectrics and talking about how they have absorption. And at the beginning, we said the great thing about glass is that glass is transparent all the way through the visible. So we seem to say that there was no absorption. So what's going on is usually when you think of a dielectric like glass is you basically are saying it's transparent in the visible and I is really, really small, right? And I is essentially zero for glass in the visible. But if you go back to that expression for the complex refractive index, of you know, n tilde, n r plus n i. It's this big complicated mess and it has this resonant part in it. Right? We're in the bottom, it's a square root of omega squared minus omega naught squared. And if that goes to zero, everything gets big. Well, n i does get big, okay? So n i and therefore also alpha, the absorption is large at, or you're at a frequency about equal to omega naught. That was the natural frequency, the resonance, where all these little, whatever these things are, we describe them just as the electrons are a mass on a spring. Wherever that resonance hits, you actually are going to have a large, large absorption. And for glass, that just doesn't happen in the visible. Okay? So I'm going to show you that now. We're going to have a look at um, absorption in glass. Here, and let's see, let me explain what we've got here. So here we have just a small optical source. This is a xenon flash lamp. And 
Uh, out of here comes light all the way down to about 200 nanometers. I'm not getting my finger in it when it's on. And this is just a small spectrometer. So the light comes in, it analyzes it as a function of wavelength, and you see the result here. So here we're plotting the, I'm going to plot in a minute, the transmittance, how much light gets through from 200 UV, this is all UV, up to 400. Now this is the visible, 700 into the visible, and then the near IR. Okay, so we have a very broad spectral range that we get here because this lamp puts out a lot of light. So we turn the lamp on and we calibrate it real quick. So hit that, turn the lamp off for a second. We'll get a dark reference here. Everything drifts, so it's always good to redo it at the last minute. Turn it back on and get another bright reference. And now what you're seeing is we've, we've uh, calibrated it where it's giving us 100% uh, transmission as it just goes through air, okay? It's drifting up and down a little bit. Everything's not perfectly stable. So we've calibrated again. Now here I have a piece of glass and we know glass to be transparent, but that's in the visible. So let's look at the transmission on glass as we go to a broader range of wavelengths all the way down to 200. So if I just balance the glass there, now you can see the glass is nice and transparent from 700 and the visible and the red all the way down to 400. It's dropped from 100% to 90%. And there's a good reason, and we'll talk about it later. Maybe you already know, bonus points if you already know. But here we can see a big drop in the transmission. Almost nothing is transmitting here at about 275. So this is all the UV. There's sort of UVA, not so dangerous, UVB, getting dangerous, UVC, very dangerous. So we have stuff down into the UVC here. That's why we're not getting too close. And it looks even like a resonance. You can see a dip right here at about 275. So that is similar to the resonance we've been describing. This is where omega naught is. And we get a very large NI at that resonance. Therefore, we get a very large absorption. So you might think that is the resonance of SiO or SiO2, the, the glass structure, the silica that makes up glass, but it actually isn't. That's still impurities in the glass. Here is another piece of glass, and this is more expensive and more pure glass. And you know it's more expensive because it's in a little container. Whenever someone gives you a microscope slide that has its own container, it's expensive. It says quartz microscope slide on it. So basically this is quartz, this is more purified glass. And the name quartz is kind of thrown around a lot, okay? So glass is glassy, it's not crystalline. Sometimes you think of quartz, meaning the crystalline version, but sometimes quartz just means really pure glass, and it's still not crystalline. Usually you say crystalline quartz when you mean the crystal that you see at the museum. If you say quartz around glass people, it just means really pure uh, glass. And if I put that on there, nothing. So there is no resonance in the UV. This is transmitting plenty of UV, right? Perfectly flat. And I'm not tricking you, so here's the glass again. Glass, uh, cheap glass, big absorption at about 275 nanometers. And here's my quartz, no absorption. So whatever that peak is, it's not the SiO2, it's not the silica itself. It's impurities in the glass. And we know glass has impurities. The most common is iron and that makes the grass, glass look kind of green. If you put in a lot of impurities, so here's a really old bottle I found in the demo uh, closet. Everything in the demo closet is old. Um, these days, if you found a bottle this green, it would be because they put the impurities in on purpose and they're trying to make a green bottle. This is probably so old that this was typical glass back then, like when you look at really old windows. So if I put this on here and the light still gets through, now you can see why it's green. So something in it is giving sort of a resonance that's absorbing here at the blue. So this is 400, this is violet, and this is blue. It's transmitting pretty well in the green. Here's 532, like my laser pointer in the green. And then some resonances are absorbing again in the red. So if you just consider visible from 700 to 400, this thing is mostly passing the green. So when you look at it on transmission, that's why you see green. So these resonances occur to many, many materials in the glass but it all perfectly matches what we've been talking about. These individual little um, loose electrons in the glass oscillate really hard and absorb energy, and that's why we get these spectral features. 